everybody. I hope you can hear me. It's delightful to see such a fantastic turnout, and apologies to those of you who have to sit on the floor. Um, I'm Victoria Holt. I'm the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth, and I am delighted and pleased that you are joining us tonight for a very special event, Voices of Dissent, with our extraordinary guests, Gary Kasparov and Evan Moari. The Dickey The Dickey Center is dedicated to the vision of John Sloan Dickey, the former president of Dartmouth. And one of the things he was known for after World War II was coming here and saying to the students that the world's problems are our problems. But he didn't just do that. He went out of his way to talk about dialogue, debate, and equipping students both with a moral sense of the issues of the world, but also the tools to make a difference in them. So I'm very proud that we here at Dartmouth are continuing that tradition, a tradition that's continued for decades. I'd also like to thank Dartmouth alumni Matt Calkins, who's here, who introduced us to our speakers, who had the idea for the series and has given us the support to make it happen. Thank you, Matt. So before we start, what does it mean to be a dissident today? What and how do people have the courage to do that? Worldwide, we see people fighting and seeking for rights and values, the same ones that we fight for here and cherished by Americans such as the freedom of speech, religion and assembly, the right to vote and seek justice, the ability to debate political issues freely and to live with a government that safeguards, not threatens, citizens. But every day around the world, individuals are fighting for those rights, and those who advocate for democracy and freedom may face dramatic changes to their lives, often forever, when they speak up and raise a voice against prevailing authority of government, a political party, another entity, or even individuals. They may face persecution, jail, torture, and exile. And for many dissidents, leaving their country is their only choice for survival. Thus, the consequences of a rise in non-democratic states and the increase in authoritarianism affects not just those people, but all of us, including here in the United States. We know that worldwide, the levels of displacement are at a decade high. Over 80 million people have fled their own homes because of persecution, torture, oppression, and political strife. Actually, it's 90 million. Freedom House, which is well known for monitoring all this, has documented a global decline over the last 15 years in democracy and a rise of authoritarianism, with the democratic decline also seen in traditionally democratic nations and US allies. And it warns that this is not just something that America can ignore. It notes that America's place in the world and democracy's place in America are inextricably linked. So, as I've mentioned, Dartmouth has a history of these discussions. Martin Luther King came here 60 years ago and talked to Dartmouth students about the importance of human progress not being considered inevitable, but it requires good people, all people, to act. I also know that the students here are from all over the world. They come with lively minds and questions and different experiences, it's much like our fantastic faculty and staff. And for all of us, there's a question of agency. What can we do as individuals? And what can we do as an institution and as part of a larger community? So with that, I could not be more pleased to introduce two outstanding individuals and international dissidents. So what I will do is I will introduce them, and then I'll invite Gary Kasparov to come up after a short film is shown about him, and then to introduce his colleague, Avon, a short film, and then they, he will give remarks. We will then go to a moderated discussion. So, Gary Kasparov is known to many of you. He became the under-18 chess champion of the US R at the age of 12, and by uh, the age of 22, was the only chess champion in history in 1980. He's also known for his famous matches against the IBM supercomputer, Deep Blue, which in 1996 and 97 were key to bringing artificial intelligence and chess into the mainstream. But he was also well known when he became one of the first prominent Soviets to call for democratic and market reforms. By 2005, he had retired from professional chess to join the vanguard of the Russian pro-democracy movement, facing arrest and imprisonment. By 2012, he was named chairman of the New York-based Human Rights Foundation, succeeding Lakhvil Havel, and he faced imminent arrest during Putin's crackdown and moved to, from Moscow to New York City in 2013. Today, he is a founder and a leader of the Renew Democracy Initiative, uh, a, a group that you'll hear more about later. 
Let me also introduce Yvonne Moari, who is the founder, who's, who's an educator and a pastor. Um, and he has an amazing story about becoming the founder of the This Flag Citizen Movement in Zimbabwe, his home country, where he sought to confront corruption, injustice, and poverty. It was instrumental in unseating Robert Mugabe, known to many of us. He also faced persecution, threats, and imprisonment, and left for the United States. Today, he's the Director of Education for the Renew Democracy Initiative. He also is a Reagan, uh, sorry, Reagan Fassel Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy, a former fellow at Stanford University Center for Democracy Development and the Rule of Law, a 2020 Yale University World Fellow, and named as the 2016 African of the Year by the Daily Maverick Newspaper of South Africa, and one of 100 top global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine. These are extraordinary individuals, and thank you for joining us to hear their stories. Last thing, some of you may have picked up a little index card and a tiny little pencil. If you have a question, please write it down now, and at some point, raise your hand. We've got people in the room who will be collecting it. That's a way that you'll have a chance to ask a question of our speakers today. With that, may I turn the podium over to you, actually, to the film about Gary, and then Gary will welcome you to the stage. <laughs> I should go to Gary Kasparov. He is waiting for 14 years. He was the world's top chess master. My old job. World chess champion Gary Kasparov. For 20 years, Gary Kasparov was the greatest chess player in the world. My fame came from the world of chess. Chess was treated in the Soviet Union back in the Stalin's days as a very important ideological tool to prove the superiority of communist regime over decadent West. That's why having Soviet world champion was so important for the system. I was half Armenian, half Jewish boy, born in Baku and raised there. Being uh, a Jew in Soviet Union was a challenge. Yes, it puts extra pressure on you. It's either crushes you or makes you stronger. I'm still here. <laughs> it hasn't crushed me. <laughs> I grew up in the environment where only victory was an acceptable result. Anything but gold medal is a failure. When I was a kid, teenager, my mother had a poster on top of my bed that said, if not you, who else? My mother accompanied me at any event that I went on. She always was there as the, as the head of the team. My first trip abroad, I was sent to France. I was not allowed to travel with my mother, which was a big, of course, pushback. They, they never let families to travel because they wanted to make sure that I, I would not be tempted to stay there. The gap between uh, Soviet propaganda and the free world he was exposed almost on just on, on, on every level. But at the same time, I knew that I had to play by the rules to have my chance winning the title. All I wanted at that time to become world champion. Arguably, my uh, rivalry with Carpo was the greatest in history of any sport. Phenomenal player with unique talent, but he always had tailwind that pushed him even further because he was Russian, a loyal soldier of the Communist Party and the regime. He's on one side of the Iron Curtain, and I'm on the other. We played uh, 48 games. Somehow I managed to survive. And I told my mother, not talk, I shouted. Mommy, they let me beat Karpov. I became the youngest world champion. And that was not just a chess victory. It was more like a signal that the Soviet system that looked very much frozen on time could actually be melted. Chess world champion was always kind of the high priest in, in the big temple. It was not my choice to actually uh, to merge chess and politics. Those were Soviet realities. And I knew that, you know, that world champion, I could afford more than ordinary Soviet citizens. I could feel it. Would um, be important for millions of my compatriots to see young world champion being an active agent of change would encourage them 
1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the triumph of freedom around the world, we all expected things to move almost automatically into the future, in the, in the bright future. Very few, if any, thought about threats of being thrown back to the dark ages of dictatorship. I felt, rightly or wrongly, I could make a difference, so I, uh, I wanted to dive in. Former chess champion is ready to play a new game, and this time the stakes will be much higher. You are running in a presidential election. I think you are already the opposition candidate, where your life may literally be on the line. Is that an exaggeration? Do you fear for your life? Do you take precautions? If you ask me whether my fight against Putin's dictatorship is personal, yes, it is personal. It was more about restoring democracy and, and, and defending human rights. I knew I had to do it. I had to try. I had to try it for my, for my kids. This regime is criminal. It's a police state. I cannot explain it. I cannot give you just calculation. It's not chess, you know? It's not I play here, he or she plays there, and it's this. No, it's, um, it's about what's inside of you. Look, it's being arrested is, is unpleasant. Being arrested violently, it's, it's, it's very unpleasant. People keep asking, Mr. Kasparov, what do you think about uh, so many Putin enemies being murdered? Do you worry about your personal security? The moment you ask this question, you assume that I had a choice of not doing that. And I don't think I did. It's like your life mission. I, I would like to see Russia to be free, but it's not just to, for the sake of my country. Democracy doesn't exist in a vacuum. The idea that you can, you know, isolate your democracy and protect it while ignoring the rest of the world does not work these days. I had no choice. And uh, it was a very painful decision. And I spoke to my mother, and she also realized that it would be much better for me to continue my, my fight while being free outside of Russia than facing imminent arrest and uh, jail time in Putin's Russia. We spoke every day, at least once a day. And uh, I knew there was a rule that uh, the moment my plane takes off or lands, I have to call her, whether it was five in the morning in Moscow, whatever time, so just any, any crazy hour. So she dedicated her life to her last breath, Christmas night, 2020, when she died from COVID in Moscow, to her, to her son. So she, she was a very loyal and devoted woman. And um, I, it's still feel, feel so bad and just it's that I couldn't I couldn't um, um, hold her hand when 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 she passed away because that was her dream so she always wanted to to close her eyes to to go and just to, just for a final rest with me next to her I learned from my mother and uh, from great Soviet dissidents that you, know, you have to take a stand. That the purpose of our life, the purpose of any activities that we are undertaking, it's to make a difference. It's a, it's a classical motto of Soviet dissidents, do what you must and so be it. If not you, who else? coincidences, but I also believe in KGB. <laughs> um, 
Believe it or not, it's the first time I saw it. So uh, and they did a very good job. So we just to cut uh, two hours or so of recording in the seven minutes. Um, when I left professional chess back in 2005, uh, so the first question I was asked by journalists and repeatedly asked is, uh, Mr. Kasparov, did you think that your chess experience, your chess skills could help you to navigate in these muddy waters of Russian politics and fight well, uh, against Putin's, Putin's uh, regime? Um, my answer was absolutely not, because in chess, I always say we have fixed rules and unpredictable results. In Putin's Russia, it's exactly the opposite. As you can guess, rules change all the time, but results stay the same. Uh, so um, it, I tell you that just to um, uh, communicate this message once again, that uh, I had very little hope that I could be as successful as in chess. <coughs> but it's... It's about taking a stand, and uh, you saw few of the few of the moments of the arrests, and um, and somehow I pioneered uh, uh, this uh, very dark uh, pages of Russian history, because I remember when I was first time arrested back in April 2007 uh, for peaceful rallies, and I can tell you that we had not a single act of violence from our side. Uh, I. People who marched with me on the streets of Russia, like uh, uh, myself now in exile, or in jail like Alexei Navalny, or Volodya Karamurza, or killed like Boris Nemtsov. But we never had an act of violence. The only violence on the streets came from the riot police or Putin security apparatus. And there, it was April 14th, to uh, 2007, and uh, um, uh, they just took me, it's, it's, just before actually I managed to join the demonstration, against Putin. Uh, they took me out of a cafe and then just put me uh, uh, in front of the judge. And, and then I saw the report of a policeman. And I said, your honor, uh, I never seen this guy before. But the report said that he arrested you. I said, yeah, can I check, you know, can you tell me where you arrested me? And of course he, he gave a wrong address. And of course it was a, d a very wrong time because you know, my arrest was, was, was on video so that, and then the judge said something very significant. So, no, no, we, the, this court uh, trusts policemen because he's wearing, he wears uniform. Okay, I was fined 1,000 rubles, about $40 at the time, and everybody just was laughing. I, I remember many Western journalists say, ah, joke. I said, no, 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 guys, this is not a joke. This is a principle. It's, they start with a fine. They end up with years in jail. My next uh, arrest was already five days in jail. So, um, and uh, it's again the same story. They just, you know, they, they took no evidence from, from videos so this, uh, and others. Now today, actually I call these days vegetarian times. Because today for the same quote unquote crime, you would end up in jail for five or 10 years. Today you can end up in jail for two or three years just for a tweet, you know, on social media. So just to give an idea. But that's, you know, that's, that's just sliding down. That, but it started with, with a principle. The policeman is always right because he wears uniform. Um, and then you also saw at the very end, you know, this is the, my last arrest um, uh, uh, on, on uh, August 17, 2012. I was just standing in, in, in the crowd waiting for pussy riot, a verdict. So, and then just took me out and then just put me in a bus. I tried to, to escape. They beaten, I was beaten. And then they decided that it was time to actually to punish me seriously. And, and, uh, they accuse me of biting a policeman. Yeah, biting a policeman is, is a physical attack on, 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 a, on, on a man in uniform, which you could, even at that time, could, you know, could uh, give you five years in prison. But again, it was 2012. They were not ready to, to, to ignore everything, including uh, every, uh, every um, shot that was made over this 20, I think 22 seconds of, of, this, of, the, of this fight. So that which is covered from so many angles, and they just proved eventually that this little cut on the on, on, on the hand of the policeman, of uh, the police officer, uh, so was actually uh, I was there before they attacked me. So this, this happened elsewhere. So they let me go. So that's the. But I knew already that this is the last time. So just I had to take it seriously. Uh, but I haven't lost my sense of humor. 
So when I left this the courtroom, I said that, you know, I was insulted by the whole, whole procedure because if I would bite a police officer, I would not do it for anyone below rank of major general. So, um, and in 2013, so by, you know, learning that I was investigated by, uh, by Russian uh, in, uh, analog, uh, uh, analog of FBI, so on political activities, I decided I had to stay, um, to stay um, uh, away from home. That was a tough decision, but again, I knew there was no other, no other choice. Um, but I uh, haven't uh, dropped my hopes for, for Free Russia one day. So I, uh, um, I've been very active in pushing the sanctions. Um, and, and I also uh, worked uh, on, on various projects uh, uh, on human rights because I came up with the conclusion that you cannot, you cannot separate your fight for democracy in your country with the rest of the world. You know, it's all, it's all we, the world is intertwined. Point. And, uh, and uh, uh, I could see how, how dictators, how the bad guys, you know, m working together. And they, by the way, they're very, very, very good in, in finding each other and helping each other. Now you all, I'm sure, following this uh, revolution in Iran, the women revolution in Iran, so which is, makes me feel sad because I always say that I wish Russian men would be as brave as Iranian women. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, even at that time, perilous time for the Iranian regime, for the mullahs, they believe that they have to send their drones and missiles to help Putin. Because it's, it's, they, they know that it's all connected. It will be a domino effect. Putin goes down and the, um, the, the wind of freedom will blow everywhere. And, uh, and it, will, it may wash away dictators from North Korea to Venezuela, from Belarus to Zimbabwe. So they are helping Putin. So we all also have to, also have to uh, work together. And since 2012, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been working as a chairman of Human Rights Fo uh, Foundation, followed my great hero, uh, uh, Václav Havel. And in 2017, I formed a Renewed Democracy Initiative. We'll talk about it later here in the United States. So I'm very happy to be here because the the, um, the idea that we got, so it's, the, uh, it's to make sure that the experience of dissidents from around the world can ap be applied to, um, to the countries where democracy is very often taken for granted. And I don't blame you because you were born, I'm, not, I'm sure this is, it's a mixed audience, but in general, so in America, you're born in a free country, you take it for granted, and it's very important that you, know, uh, you hear from us people who um, experienced uh, very different kind of troubles. So something that is, is a problem here, like a police brutality, is a system in my country, or in Zimbabwe. Or, so um, our experience can help you. So as much as we looked at America, you know, as a beacon of hope, now it's time for us to pay the debt. So, um, and uh, um, uh, having said that, so I think it's a good time to introduce my friend and colleague, even Mavarini, uh, one of the best speakers I ever heard. So we met in Oslo at the Oslo Freedom Forum, and I was truly impressed by, by, by his presentation. And uh, the, this, the, when I learned that he had to also leave his country, uh, his uh, mother country, and, and, and uh, ended up in, on the same soil as I, just, you know, this New York, Boston nearby. So I immediately thought that we had to uh, bring him in into the Renew Democracy Initiative, and uh, he's now uh, director of our educational programs. He's in charge of exactly the program I described. Is how to um, how to uh, um, uh, merge the experience uh, of dissidents from around the world to help countries like the United States uh, not to slide into this very dangerous path. Thank you very much, Ivan. It's now it will be, yes. We all knew that you could die, you could get brutalized, you could get jailed, and you could never be seen or heard from again. This is what happened to people that confronted Robert Mugabe. You know, a year before, you couldn't have paid me to do what I did, simply because of the kind of fear that was associated with doing that kind of thing.
My name is Ivan Mawarire. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm an everyday, you know, family man past. I had two kids at the time who were expecting a third one. The day that I recorded that video, I was really angry. Hmm. I had literally spent the day trying to figure out how to pay for some very basic things that my family needed, and that included food. With Zimbabwe in meltdown and its economy in freefall, the veteran president, Robert Mugabe, attended the state opening of parliament last month. As a people, Zimbabweans, we were scared. I'm sitting in my office. I see the Zimbabwean flag. The thought that came to me actually was, this flag is a lie. This flag, this, this beautiful flag. And so I take my phone and I propped it up against my Bible. I just start to speak from my, from my heart. They tell me that the black, the black is for, is for the majority, people like me. And yet for some reason, I don't feel like I am a part of it. Quit standing on the sidelines and watching this flag fly. Every day that it flies is begging for you to get involved, is begging for you to say something, is begging for you to try out and to say why. I didn't have a big following. And I think there was a sense of, I don't think that many people will see this. Within hours, the post had attracted over 10,000 views and within days, over 100,000. All over the world, hundreds of Zimbabweans have responded by posting photos of themselves wrapped in the national flag. They say they feel patriotic again in a country where rights groups say civil liberties are routinely violated and where those who dare to criticize the leadership face arrest. You know, people were saying things like, by end of the day, Ivan will either be dead or be in prison. Thousands of these comments coming through. There's that sudden sense of realizing, oh my gosh, what have I done? Literally everywhere I went, people recognized who I was. People would say, thank you for what you're doing. You almost want to say under your breath, you have no idea how scared I am right now. There are days I just want to be a nobody and just go back into blending into being a nobody. Hi, this is Ivan Mawarire in Harare, Zimbabwe. We are now officially on day number three. Pastor E here, we are on uh, day five. Fellow citizens, we are now on day number 19. My father called me. He said to me, what are you doing? These people will kill you. And he gave me testimony of people he knew that had been murdered. I said, no, Baba. When you live in an oppressive society, every generation that does not draw the line burdens the next generation to have to do it. I'm not letting them do the same thing to my kids. And I said, Dad, I'm sorry, I can't stop right now. We are standing up, Tasum Katisa saying enough is enough. There was no plan. We literally built the plane as, as it flew. Our people remain strong. The dream was to increase the number of people that had the courage to speak truth to power. This flag. This flag. And there was a moment in which we then decided, OK, let's attempt to shut this whole country down. What we were going to ask Zimbabweans to do was to take one day off, not going to work, not opening your businesses, not getting on the street, and just staying indoors. I still don't know who I thought I was at that point saying those words. And it's a make or break moment because if no one takes heed, we're done. Not only are we done as a movement, but then they will come after us, the government, and they'll get us good. And in that moment, you realize that you, you don't want it. You don't want to die, you want to live. You want to be part of the victory. You want to see what it looks like when we get a breakthrough. You want to stand on top of the mountain and enjoy the view with everybody. But you, you also realize that sometimes walking a journey like this means that you have to be okay with not, with not seeing that. Wednesday, the 6th of July, 2016, we are shutting Zimbabwe down. Get off the roads and stay home. Nobody goes to work on that day. We want them to know that we are serious. Wherever you are, no violence. It's our day. We are all Zimbabweans. Talk to you again soon. Pastor Evan Mawarire called on Zimbabweans to stay at home in protest against the country's economic troubles.
morning comes and you're trying to listen out to the normal activity that lets you know that the morning bustle has started. Someone put up something that said there's no one. I'm in the central business district and there's no one. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, this is working. Civil servants held a stay-at-home protest that shut down most businesses, government offices, schools and hospitals for a day. It was the biggest act of public defiance against Robert Mugabe in a decade. We have a completely, completely shut down city. The whole thing came to a complete standstill. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God. <laughs> they did it. And these are people who are not scared. These are brave people, you know? This is, this is a citizen's coup. You also realize the most unexpected things can break a system that no one ever thought could be, could be broken. The story of the state of your freedom and democracy today will one day be told. It will be told whether you agree or not. Make sure that when they tell it, they are never able to say that you did nothing. Thank you. I um, am always surprised when I get a chance to look back on on the journey that we walked. And I'm surprised not just at myself but at the power that ordinary people do not know that they have. I've learned over the last six years the importance of speaking up to defend the things that I hold dearly to me. And the journey began with the fight for my children. That's what that first video was about. When I realized that my children would have to live under the same oppression that my grandfather had lived through, that my father had lived through, and at 39 years old, the oppression that I had lived through too. I've learned that speaking truth to power, or dissent, or raising your voice for the things that you believe has a price. And sometimes we, we, we want someone else to do it for us. When the crowds are too big that are against us, we would rather be silent or get someone else to, to do it. But it takes, it takes each of us. Robert Mugabe had brutalized Zimbabweans to the extent that we did not think it was possible to see him go. In fact, his wife had declared at one point that Robert Mugabe would rule Zimbabwe from the grave. He was 92 years old when she said that. He had led our country through some of the most disastrous economic collapses that you could ever imagine. In 2008, our economy crashed so badly that we ended up with a $100 trillion note as part of our notes, banknotes. 
Think about that for a second. A banknote that says $100 trillion. At that point, they had slashed off three zeros. So it was really a one sextillion dollar note. And at the height of inflation, it was not enough to buy bread. Our inflation was running at 287 million percent. And nobody said anything. We just took it. When Robert Mugabe lost the election that year to a man called Morgan Changirai, who was a brave opposition politician, he simply refused to go. And our nation had to negotiate power with a man whom we knew had lost the election, but wanted to stay. And we let him stay. Just before that election ended, he unleashed a, a campaign of terror in the areas where people had voted against him. And he went there and said, those of you that voted against me in your region, we have the results. We're going to remind you that in the next election, you will vote correctly. And we will give you a reminder that you will never forget and that your children will never forget. Old men and old women and young men and young women in rural areas that voted against Robert Mugabe were given the choice of what they called short sleeve or long sleeve. And it was an exercise in which they asked you to put forth the hand that you used to vote, and you were to decide whether it would be chopped off at the wrist or at the elbow. That's the kind of trauma that Zimbabweans had faced. So to see them stand up in that moment with an ordinary person whom they barely knew, was a powerful, powerful thing. The first time that I was arrested and thrown into Chikurubi Maximum Security Prison, I was scared and thought that that was the end. But I found an unlikely ally. The first four men that approached me, I thought were men that were going to beat me and, and rape me in that prison. But instead, these four men approached me and introduced themselves, and they said, we know who you are and what you have been doing. And because we have families that are outside, that we have left, and we are under arrest, and we don't know what to do for them, our contribution to the struggle for our nation is that for as long as you are in this maximum security prison, we will look after you. We will prepare you for the moments of torture that you will face because there's nothing we can do about that. But our job is going to be that for as long as you are here, you are getting stronger, and that by the time you leave, you are stronger than you were when you came. Four men. One of them is a convicted murderer. The other is a self-confessed armed robber. And the other two were cattle thieves. They became my best friends. They became the men I went to for support to recuperate. They became the men that educated me on the struggles of the ordinary person in Zimbabwe and said to me, when you go, speak about this. When you go, talk about this. No matter what the state of your democracy is, and I hope that we get a chance to talk about this, never lose the agency to speak and participate in your democracy. I get frustrated at people who live with freedom, who have lived with freedom all their lives, and pretend as if it's, it is worthless. The fact that you can go out into the city square and criticize your government 
and immediately go off to the coffee shop and have a coffee and forget about that and go home and have a good night's sleep is something that I dream of. It takes courage to speak in the face of people who do not agree with you. It takes courage also to engage with somebody whose views you do not agree with. If there's anything I leave with you, which is part of the message we carry with Frontlines of Freedom that Gary was talking about, it is the sense that democracy is not built only by one set of voices or only by one set of beliefs and values. It is built in a space where we allow a competition of ideas. It is built in a space where we allow each other to talk and to listen and to, yes, oppose each other and allow the strongest idea to be the one that prevails. Does it take courage even here? I believe it does. We may face different types of repression, but at the end of the day, it seeks to take away the agency that ordinary people have to determine and to decide amongst themselves the kind of governance or the kind of nation that they would like to have. Therefore, keeping quiet or walking away disempowers or robs the future of what you should have together. I boarded a plane back to Zimbabwe in January of 2017. That was after six months in exile. When we escaped after that first arrest and some of the images you saw, I had a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and my wife was pregnant, which is the perfect time to start a citizen's movement in a dictatorship. Isn't it? When we arrived here, my daughter was born two months after. But I couldn't sleep at night knowing that we had left a country in turmoil, that we had left a citizens' movement that needed to grow. So, two months after she was born, I asked my wife if I could go back. Her response was, if you want to die, I could do that for you right now. <laughs> Eventually, she agreed, and I left for Zimbabwe. I landed back in Harare on 1st of February 2017 and was immediately arrested at Harare International Airport. I was taken to the maximum security prison where I was beaten, and I was tortured in ways I cannot talk about publicly. I do not regret everything we did for my nation because it has allowed a new generation of people to learn how to speak up, to learn how to be in a democracy that allows conversations, that allows people to dissent. When I finally came back to the US and I got free of the jail, my daughter, who I had left, who was two months old, was three years old. She barely recognized me. But I traded three years of my children's lives for the opportunity to tell them one day that your dad did not expect someone else to speak up and stand up for what is right. My hope is that as we speak this evening, we can leave with you some sense of responsibility for doing what is right for your democracy and also what is right for the peoples of the world because we do, believe it or not, with the challenges that this democracy has, we do look up to it, we do admire it. And we implore you, as young as you are, as old as you are, 
we implore you to be responsible with it. Tori, thank you. Thank you both. I think um, <laughs> that's quite a powerful combination of uh, film and remarks. So before I turn to you with a few questions, I just want to remind the audience, if there's a question you would like to ask, write it on that little piece of paper, raise your hand, and one of my colleagues uh, will come over and pick it up. And then we will turn to those questions after I start the conversation. I was going to ask you both to describe a bit more what this meant for you personally. I think you've also touched on it already. But was there a moment when you made a decision that you knew that you were going to choose this path? And did you understand what it would, what it would force you to face? Ravon, maybe start with you. I think there's always um, a moment in which you have a choice to, to act. You don't always have the time to decide or the time to think about the full repercussions of what your actions will mean in respect to what we did. But it feels right. You feel like this is a, this is a moment that I don't, want to, I don't want to miss. And to be honest, we, I did try to walk back out of it in the early moments of that first video going out. And I'll never forget trying my best to record another video to explain what I was not saying in that first video. But by the end of that video, I was so full of rage that that video went even more viral than the first one. <laughs> and so we had the brilliant idea of recording a third video to explain what I was not trying to say in the <laughs> second video, which I was not saying in the first video. And I'll let you I'll let you figure out what happened with that third video. At that point, we knew that we were onto something and that we knew we couldn't walk back. It was a moment that we didn't choose, but that chose us, and we needed to embrace it. And so the consequences became part of the journey that we knew we had to face either way. Yeah. Well, so Gary, you could have lived a very gilded life. You were already internationally renowned, you moved, I'm sure, in very elite circles, and yet you chose a different path with great consequences. Was there a moment where you felt you made a decision? Like Ivan, I don't think I can come up with one specific moment, but it's somehow, you know, just it was the forced choice. You know, when people ask me about, you know, just comfortable life. Now, we have to work on definition. What does an uncomfortable life? having, you know, just uh, material benefits or being, you know, just in peace with yourself. So you do what is right. I have, I have a comfortable life. Yeah, it's just it's because I do what is right. And uh, I do what my mother taught me. And uh, uh, it was all about making a difference. That's why I stayed on top on the world of, of, the world of chess for so long. Because I always knew that it, it's, uh, winning is not enough. You have to go back and be very you know, very honest with yourself, you know, just analyzing the games, finding your mistakes, to be sure the next day when all your opponents who were beaten before you know, learn from, your, from, this, uh, uh, from their mistakes, they come back, you will be, again, you'll be at the cutting edge, one step ahead. So it's about making a difference. So it's, uh, I used to say that, you know, as long as you challenge your own excellence, you will never be, short, you will never be short of opponents. Uh, so that's why when I knew that, I, you know, the moment for me, just, you know, the moment to quit chess, because I already accomplished more than I could have dream, dreamed of. Uh, so, and uh, I either had to leave Russia at that point, but it was not an option yet. Uh, I thought I had to um, try again to make a difference. Mm. And it's about uh, uh, joining, uh, uh, it's more like creating anti-Putin movement. Um, I thought that maybe we had a chance. As I already mentioned in my brief remarks, I wasn't sure how, how good was this chance. And frankly speaking, I didn't care. It was not about chess. It's not about winning or losing. It's about making a difference and making what, what I believe was right. So 
it's happened almost almost automatically. So it's just it's, it's, I started my new life. I also married. So uh, of 2005, that was the my third try was which was successful one. So and uh, and 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 I moved from chess into into my new life. And uh, as I say I'm comfortable. I do many things. You know, that's just I'm. I'm a speaker, just you know, talk about uh, artificial intelligence, I talk about uh, cybersecurity, crypto, uh, decision making, but I never you know, stopped doing what I believe was, you know, was my utmost duty, fighting for, for human rights and democracy. Thank you. you. You both have written publicly and have already mentioned this in the remarks, that you look at the United States as a democracy that should be defending itself in a sense and that we should honor those higher sort of values or rights that we have here. Many Americans look at the United States and see what's missing and see what they need to fight for. And so could you both elaborate a little bit on how we balance those things from seeing both what the ideals are here and the flaws are here and how particularly Americans should be aware of what you've gone through in thinking about fighting for that? Mm. In other words, why do dissidents look to the United States? Just to elaborate a little bit more. Because the United States is still the leader of the free world. Uh, and uh, um, we all looked at the United States as the beacon of hope. And, and today, believe it or not, so hundreds of millions of people still look at the United States, expecting America to, to, uh, to lead. Um, you know, um, uh, we came from the places where people are willing to make huge sacrifices for the right to vote. How many of you are American citizens? Okay, almost all that. How many of you vote regularly? Oh, that's good. That's a good participation <laughs> still. Yeah, so it's, it's but still the number of people who vote in this country it's for people like us, me, and even it's almost an insult. And then you complain that democracy doesn't work. You know why it doesn't work? Because you're not participating. <laughs> democracy for us, <laughs> it's your never ending engagement. It's, it's for you. It, 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 it doesn't guarantee you, you know, just it's, it's, it's comfortable life. It, it's not. I, democracy is not uh, a free ticket to, to, to heaven, but it's not, you know, it, it's also, it's not an entry in, 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 in through the gates of hell. It's just, it's a tool. Mm. And you can use it, or you don't want to use it, so, but don't complain. So we, you know, we think that it's very important for Americans to understand that this is how valuable and fragile this, this, this institution is. Um, it's the, you have plenty of room, you know, for disagreement. Uh, but again, it's, it, this democracy has mechanism of self-correction. Dictatorships do not accept uh, the very idea that dictator or the institution that rules the country can be wrong on any instance. So um, uh, we think that is the, 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 the problem in, in, in this country now that is just people have a losing face in democracy as an institution but also they just don't appreciate the, the value of history of American democracy. You have one side that is trying to, to, to idolize the past and the other side is trying to trash it. So both are wrong. So just it's, it's uh, American democracy is not, you know, it's, the, it's, it's a paved road, so it's, it's a bumpy road, but it's a one way street. You, you, you sh we learn from you how to address issues and solve them. It doesn't happen overnight. Many things are not happening as fast as we want, but it keeps getting stronger and better. It's a never-ending quest for perfect union. So uh, we hope that our voices could help Americans to, to, to become proactive. Because if, if you are proactive, then you, know, then you have so many opportunities to, to, to uh, cure the ills of, 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 uh, uh, um, of uh, your society and, and to come up with creative solutions that, that again, that will be needed because even the most perfect documents written in the 18th century, they could not address the issues that we're dealing with today. And we just have to recognize it. So it was the, yeah, we, we take, you know, this, this, the constitutional documents as the, 
uh, not as the absolute dogma, but as the as the instrument for us to to adjust for the for, for the more modern challenges. So, there has to be a a, a very a very um, a big reality check as to the alternative to the loss of democracy. And I, I, I get the sense that sometimes people don't think through what replaces democracy. When you lose a democratic system of governance, what replaces it is something that you, you may not understand in terms of a lived reality. Um, and, and so that for me is just one of the reasons to say you don't want the alternative. Because we encounter people who speak about American democracy, and I'm talking about Americans who talk about it from the perspective of it being so flawed that it is, it is no longer usable. They actually hate it and would rather see it uprooted and gone and say, Democracy doesn't work here, we don't want it. And for them, if, to them I always say that you, you, if you have lived without freedom for a minute, you will understand the value of democracy and why you should not lose it. It's as I said earlier on, that the very fact that you can criticize this democracy and still go home, means you are living in a democracy that is working. It may not be perfect, but it is working. I understand also that there are some who believe that American democracy is perfect and flawless. Like Gary said, it's a, it's a, it's a bumpy road. Nothing could be further from the truth. Democracy is about working to fix how we govern ourselves. It is working through the problems that we have, the challenges that we have. So it is flawed, but it is there. But finally, let me say that there is nothing more that dictators would love to see than the fall of this democracy. It is a day that dictatorships everywhere live for. In fact, when this country shows the slightest cracks in its democracy, they celebrate. And they use that as a reason to expand their own authoritarianism in their own regions. And so that is, 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 an, is, a, is a reason that people like ourselves, where we come from, would say, save your democracy. If not for you, for us. Because of the standard bearer that it is, I am, I am openly an admirer of this democracy because of the things that it has survived. When I look recently, the, one of the most recent seismic events that this democracy has gone through as was the January 6th incident. And for me, it is an indicator in this country when people then don't pay attention to things like the hearings of the January 6th event. And they say, oh, it's just the machinations of Washington. I come from a country where there was no accountability and continues to have be no accountability for the loss of life, the loss of the wealth of the people, and the loss of our democracy. Not one person is held accountable for all of these things. And so when you have these moments where democracy is inviting you to participate in protecting it, in activating some of the institutions, participate, be there, follow it. Because democracy thrives when the people, as Gary said, when people defend it, when people participate in, uh, in that yeah. democracy. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just to add to, to echo what, what Ivan said is this, is, you know, the word democracy, by the way, it's overused. Or understand that. So, and uh, and the word actually actually meaningless. It's just it's the uh, politically meaningless. If you look at the three founding documents of the freedom in 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 in, in the free world. So, the uh, uh, 1689, the Bill of Rights uh, uh, in in, the, in in England, Declaration of Independence, and the and the the, right, the, the Declaration of Rights of Man in France in, in 1789. So these documents, none of, all three of them have no, not, a word, not a single word democracy. Just because it's about rights. So that's, but okay, we use democracy, but dictators always talk about democracy. Of course, they always manage to add you know, uh, adjectives. 
uh, uh, it's sovereign democracy, managed democracy, whatever democracy. So, but it's very important to recognize that it's just for them, you know, the way they, they sell democracy, as even explains often as this, it's what's happening in many African countries after liberation, colonialism. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a uh, um, majority rule. Ignoring the fact that, you know, this is the two, it's of course majority rule, but two key elements that are always being missed, whether it's Zimbabwe or Russia, protection of minorities and peaceful transit of power. So, and the moment you see these two, two elements are in question, your democracy is in danger. All right, so I have one more question for you, but I'd like all of you with those note cards and my colleagues who are collecting them to bring them up when you get a chance, and I will look for someone to come to the stage. So, there's an awareness of the challenge of democracies around the world, um, the rise of authoritarianism, and very large economies now turning to non-democratic function. Um, the Biden administration put out a national security strategy which talks about support to the rules-based order, making alliances around democratic principles. Gary, you have been a rightful critic of administrations, both Republican and Democrat, for not doing enough. Yvonne, I, I don't know your views on this, but what as an international coalition or effort would you, would you think makes the most sense as both activists from your own countries? What can the United States and other countries who see themselves as democracies do together? <laughs> um, now, first of all, we have, I mean, we have to look at the facts, and it, it's all these issues about democracy and, and, and rights, they're emotional, but they're facts. Uh, there is no indication that free world is somehow is falling apart uh, economically, because you have to compare. Okay, dollar is, is a weak currency, it's still the most valuable in the world, it's relativity. It's just uh, same with the American economy. It's still the most advanced economy in the world. Uh, and for those who say, oh, we have China. Sure. You're all vaccinated, huh? Ah, who had Sinovac? <laughs> I'm sure it's Moderna and Pfizer. So uh, China, I, by the way, gave us virus. America came up with a vaccine. Didn't remember that. I'm not here to debate, you know, whether it's lab or not, but it's, it's something that happened there, and you know, they, 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 they withheld the information which caused two, 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 uh, millions and millions of people uh, 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 dying, and, and I, I, we don't even know the damage from global economy. Uh, almost everything that is, just, is happening in the world is still you know, being originated on, on our side. So, and uh, while I have, as probably some of you follow Twitter, so uh, while I have serious disagreements with Elon Musk on, on Russia and Ukraine, so I, I'm a big admirer of what he did with, with uh, SpaceX. So it's, the, uh, it's important, again, to continue exploration, and it's, again, it's happening here. So that's why I, I, I would, I would uh, 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 push back on, on those claims that you know, the big uh, countries, the big economies, they are shifting away from, from uh, free market concept. Uh, it's still the, the driving engine uh, of the world. Again, because nothing else works. So you, does capitalism have its flaws? Tons. But look at the alternative. It's, it's, again, it's all about relativity. So, um, and, uh, um, and that's why I think we just have to, just to recognize that, you know, as is this, it's everything I said about liberal democracy so applies for market economy. It's, it's no, it, there's no guarantee, it's, yes, it's sometimes unfair, but you look at the other side. So again, I grew up in the Soviet Union, and just, you know, trust me, you don't want to have the same experience. So, um, and uh, I think even you could also add to, to, to experience in, 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 in many African countries where, you know, we have the uh, uh, totalitarian or authoritarian regimes, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, being so corrupt that it, it uh, made impossible for, uh, for the domestic economies to um, take, off the, take off the ground. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I, and Gary and I have spoken about this along with many other dissidents is how easy it is for people who uh, are oppressors in our nations, how easy it is for them to store their wealth, which is stolen wealth, uh, money that they have siphoned off from our governments and store that in 
in democracies. And, and so they want the safety of economies that are in democratic nations, and yet they do not want the same democracy to exist in the nation that they plunder. And it, it has been a, a new strategy over the last couple of years to see the willingness of the free world to go after those individuals and their stored wealth that they have either stolen from uh, the nations they oppress or that they use to oppress people in those nations. And uh, Bill Browder, who is a very good friend of uh, Gary and uh, myself as well, I, I got a chance to, uh, to speak alongside him at the Human Rights Foundation and the Oslo Freedom Forum, I have launched the campaign for the Magnitsky Act, uh, which is beginning to help governments understand that unless you put pressure on the individuals who are causing tra uh, tragedies and catastrophes and who deprive others of democracies, unless you do that, you are, you are, not, you are not going to see uh, you know, you know, the, the kind of results or at least uh, a willingness to, uh, for those individuals to stop. So, so I, I feel like that, this working together to explore these different uh, uh, you know, uh, these different avenues is, is something important. We are going to be launching next year, uh, actually our executive director is somewhere here, Uriel Epstein. Uriel, you just wave your hand so they see, he's right <laughs> over there. And uh, uh, at RDI, we're, we're launching the, the Front Lines of Freedom conference next year. And the, the theme that we're considering running with is uh, um, about the, the uh, transnational repression because dictators are now beginning to go after their detractors in foreign lands where we are in exile. They are beginning to become bolder about attacking us in the free world where we are living and where we are hiding from them. I think Masih Alinejad uh, from Iran, if you're following what's happening in, in Iran, is one example where on multiple occasions at a home in Brooklyn, they've tried to assassinate her. You know about what happened to uh, Jamal Khashoggi in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, uh, you know, there's they so many that, uh, you know, that have faced this. And so part of what we're trying to do is to educate the free world and Western governments and policy makers on strategies that work to bring more pressure or at least to begin to allow the growth of uh, you know, democratic spaces in, in, uh, you know, in our regions. That's very interesting. Are there particular proposals for that last point? I mean, certainly Putin's reach beyond Russia is quite famous, and it's a good point you're making. I don't know if there are specific things you, you want to raise with us here. Okay. We'll come up to that. So uh, the audience is also very interested in both your specific countries. And we've gotten a few questions asking, what do you think the future is for Zimbabwe? And certainly, what is the future for Russia? So I know that could fill an hour. But if you had some thoughts for us, I think people are hungry for it. Avon, do you want to start with that? I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. There's, you couldn't pay me enough money to uh, choose the alternative to optimism. Uh, you know, I, I, I cannot choose a picture of despair. It's just, it's just, it's, it's not in my nature to do so. And, and so the, the, but it's also based and steeped in, in watching historical, uh, you know, the historical trajectory of oppression and people that have been oppressed. And people always find a way to fight back. People always find a way to right wrongs. People always find a way to bring balance and to bring a stop to, to what is essentially evil. So when you ask me what is the future of Zimbabwe, the future of Zimbabwe is definitely freedom. It is a free country, it is a just nation. It, it, it may not be in my lifetime, though I hope it is in my lifetime. But, but I, I will tell you that, so Gary, Gary says to me, come on, come on. In fact, I could hear Gary saying, I thought you said you're an optimist. <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing, is that it, it will come. It will happen because the actions that we do, and this is what I have found so exciting about the activism and the work that we do in Zimbabwe. The models that we built of standing up to oppression and speaking truth to power are ones that leave seeds. And seeds are powerful things because seeds can lie dormant for a long time, but when the right conditions come, those things grow. And when they grow, they produce more seeds. 
And so that for me is, is, is my perspective on Zimbabwe's democratization process or Zimbabwe's journey towards uh, freedom, that it will happen. It's definitely going to come through and it will happen through the citizenry. All right. Gary, are you an optimist? <laughs> I'm an incorrigible optimist by nature, so yeah. Even when seeds grow, they produce trees and flowers, not just other seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, while I believe that history is it's a one-way street, as I said, it's a bumpy road, um, and there are some really you know, this deep dives. But at the end, you know, I think the civilization and, uh, and progress, they, they prevail. Though the cost could be horrendous, like World War II. And now, as we speak, Ukrainians paying in blood for, for appeasement and, uh, and, and willingness of the free world to, to confront Putin's dictatorship at the earlier stage. But they are not just paying this price in blood, they are also winning. Uh, while the military victories, it's lying ahead, I think we already saw the triumph of the spirit. So uh, we are witnessing, you know, this is the heroic nation that uh, uh, decided to fight against overwhelming odds and uh, demonstrated to the rest of the world that their ideals were fighting for and dying for. And that's why, as I said, the Iranian mullahs and all these other dictators trying to help Putin because they know Putin goes down, they will go down. And that's why I'm, I'm optimistic. I, uh, while this optimism, again, doesn't mean that you know, we, we, we still have to hit the bottom. So it's not, uh, uh, we're not yet so just uh, in, in the bottom of this pit. But um, I believe that the uh, liberation of Russia from Putin's fascism uh, will begin after the Ukrainian flag is raised in Sevastopol and Ukraine is liberated and Putin's armies are destroyed and Russia, my country, would go through an equivalent of 1945 for Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, hopefully without any, any bombing campaigns. But, you know, democracy is, is, is also a state of mind. And I, while I'm highly critical about millions of my compatriots who saw or still see no wrong with the war in Ukraine, as long as it doesn't affect them. I would say probably 10% of Russians today oppose the war on moral grounds. The rest is now is upset because they suddenly they have to die there. And it's a, uh, but they had no objections of Putin's uh, continuing the genocidal war without dragging them in. But being faced with, 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 with geopolitical catastrophe of that magnitude, and we know that from Russian history that every loss of that magnitude led to the political change. Uh, with the Russian army beaten, angry, going back, with millions of refugees, not, not a very optimistic picture, of course, uh, flying you know, uh, back to Russia from Crimea and, and Eastern Ukraine with economic sanctions that are serious now and uh, are um, uh, strangling Russian economy. I think we may, we may see a phenomenon what I, that I call democracy by default. Not that millions of people overnight decided that we, we have to embrace democracy. But if the choices of uh, uh, becoming a kind of Chinese colony that's, that had to supply na natural resources to, 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 to Beijing, or trying to desperately trying to crawl back to become a member of the family of civilized nations, it's hopefully that's a choice that, that will not be that difficult. So, uh, but it's, it's all about, you know, it's, it's all about leadership. I think it's very important that while people in Russia, people in Zimbabwe or elsewhere have to do our work, but it's very important to, have to see this, the, the future. And I think that's what's happened or more likely what did not happen back then in 1991, is there was no vision of the, of, of the future that had to come from the United States, from, from, from uh, Western Europe, that time Western Europe. And now I think it's, 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 it's our duty uh, to actually come up with this vision, to make sure that you know, we, 
we have international institutions not as inept as United Nations. Did you hear much about from UN about Ukraine? No, it's, it's they're always, you know, come middle ground. There's no middle ground. There's no more equivalence. You can't blame Putin and Zelensky at the same time about the war in Ukraine. So we need something more like a League of Democracies, so where you have countries, you know, joining the organization, not just paying a lip service, but being forced to, to, um, uh, to play by the rules, both internationally and domestically. And look, we have a unique moment in the history of humanity where the free world has overwhelming advantages, militarily, economically, politically, socially, even psychologically. So all we need is just, you know, it's a political will to fight and to build the world, you know, just uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the right uh, uh, um, framework that we know it's, it's working. Again, it's not an ideal one, but still the best one that is available. Mm. Thank you. So following on that, we've had a couple of questions that have a similar theme. And I think they're picking up on your point about um, authoritarianism and, and democracies actually being subsumed, or so fake democracies in a sense. So the question is, what happens when authoritarian leaning executives take measures to erode democratic norms, attack democratic institutions, and the public does not punish them electorally? Why? Why might this be the case? Is this something related to polarization, identity, or something else, if you can under help us understand that better? And related to that is, uh, are there signs to look for that are early? I mean, in a sense, being a dissident is part of being a warning system for a country, for a people. So that's a, f a few questions all together in one place. Mm -hmm. but th help us think through what that looks like when democracies do not have the people stand up for the democratic goals. Well, to paint a picture of what it's like in Zimbabwe, where I come from, and other places, um, the departure of the citizen's voice from uh, the discourse of building their democracy has meant that the institutions that are supposed to protect us or that are supposed to protect our democracy have become overrun by the system. You know, um, so for example, the courts are fully captured. In Zimbabwe, our judiciary belongs to the regime and they do with it as they please. And so you cannot trust what comes from the judiciary or what goes to the judiciary. Usually it is used as a tool to prosecute those that uh, you know, do not, do not uh, uh, you know, agree with the regime. So, so that's one of the things that happens. There is a, 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 a corruption of the media as well. Uh, along with uh, a closing of that space. There is a closing of the civic engagement space as well. So, you know, the, the, I think those for us have been the signs in Zimbabwe that, okay, we no longer have a democracy. And here's the strangest thing is that we have a constitution that guarantees these rights. But our government has laws in place that contradict the constitution and those laws are allowed to persist. And the only way these laws can be repealed is through parliament. But our parliament is also overrun and captured and therefore is no use. And so we find ourselves in this space where we are, we are gridlocked or where we are, we are, you know, it's a catch-22 situation. You cannot run to parliament because nothing will happen for you there. You cannot run to the courts because nothing will happen there. And the media will not uh, represent the, the truth about what is happening. And so what is then left, of course, is the formation of the citizen spaces that we have formed, which are grassroots movement that start to form power blocks that politicians eventually must respect. And I said earlier on in a class where we were speaking with students that politicians understand power when it's time to vote. And, and so democracy requires that we not only vote, but we keep a track of the actions of those 
that we elected the last time. So that when the time to vote comes, we can hold them accountable and say, this is not what we elected you for, therefore we, we are going to make a different choice. And there has to be a boldness that comes with that, but it also comes with an organizing. And I see that happen in the states, in the US, where the extreme partisanship means that sometimes people are protecting certain you know, individuals who uh, you know, they want to do certain things that may be undemocratic. There has to be a counterformation to that. The, there is no replacement for the building of grassroots citizens' movements that clamor for real and genuine democratic processes. We have to get back to doing that. We cannot give that over to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to technology or to social media. We cannot just debate it on Twitter and it's done. The hard work is that we, 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 we build these grassroots movements that become the negotiating power blocks that force politicians to have to acquiesce or to have to be held accountable uh, because citizens now understand that we, could, we, could, we will have to replace you if you continue to put our democracy in danger. All right, well, thank you. Gary, did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, Yeah, when you vote in a free country, so sometimes, if not often, you have to make tough choices. And um, it's not surprising that uh, democracies are always in danger at a time of economic crisis. Economic calamities, they always make people less aware about other things. And, uh, and now we, we were at a point here in this country where the inflation and, 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 and uh, energy prices, gas prices, they turn uh, many people, the eyes of many people away from other problems. It's the fact is that so many officials that might be elected in two weeks' time, they are, they are supporters of big lie uh, and uh, election denialism, you know, could become, um, it's not a dominant ideology, but still it's a, uh, it could be represented by, by a great number of, of, uh, of um, politicians. So uh, what worries me? So, um, but at the same time, you know, we just have to understand that this, the, the, the administration, um, it's, in my view, is not doing enough to actually to ease the, uh, the pressure on people. So as the, it's a, we discussed it was even today. So as the, you know, it's, you need, um, politicians on both sides, ideal on both sides, to recognize that the interests of, this, of, of the respective parties are, just as in, are not uh, or inferior to the interests of democracy in the country. And uh, uh, so far, you know, we saw many desperate attempts of this administration to uh, ease this economic pressure by looking for alternative sources of energy. Uh, I couldn't approve them going to dictators like Venezuela or Saudi Arabia. By the way, what did we get from Saudi Arabia? Middle finger? Because Putin needs high oil prices and Biden needs low oil prices. Who did they pick? Putin. Though they depend a lot on America, you see, because of Iran and other things. But so uh, while you know I'm you know I'm devoted opponent of fossil fuel. I still think that now when you have democracy at stake, so you have to open Keystone Pipeline, 800,000 barrels a day. So that's the way to bring the prices down. So it's the, yeah, is it a good idea long term? No, but uh, while you think about long term future, just say like in chess, when your king is, is, is under threat of being made in two moves, you don't think about end game pawn structure. <laughs> so now we have this problem. So think how we can actually save democracy. So that's, that's my problem that, you know, the ideology often, you know, just dictates decisions that, in my view, are just, you know, could uh, uh, put democracy in this country in danger. All right. I think I have time to ask you both. You have a lot of people here who are students and ask you if you have any thoughts directly for them today. I will go first, Gary. <laughs> you go first, yes. <laughs> I think the, the sense of the role that you have to play in the state of your democracy today and 
the future of your democracy in this country and in the countries where many of you come from because I understand that the student um, composition here is intentionally uh, made up of those from other countries and many from countries that are repressive. The future of the state of democracy today and the future does not depend and will never depend on people who are elected. It will always depend and be decided by those who elect. And we must never lose that agency. We are seeing increasingly people lose faith in democracy and the processes of democracy. And we see narratives where people are saying more and more it doesn't work so I'm not going to do it. It is, it is a catastrophic, a catastrophic, it is a catastrophic mistake. Even if you are the only one that decides to get involved in grassroots mobilization or in, 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 in finding ways to defending the vote or finding ways to keep the conversation going about your democracy, even if you're the only one, it is worth it and is a duty that must not be abandoned. I've always said this and I'll say it as I hand over to Gary that the fight for freedom and democracy, the fight to live a free life, the fight to live in a society that respects human dignity, the fight for, for justice cannot be outsourced. It cannot be subcontracted. And when one generation abdicates their duty, they burden the next generation with a bondage that will take them longer and cost them more to break free of that. You must play your part. You must do what you need to do so that the next generation, for many of you who will have children, so that those children find a place to start from that has not set them back years, but that has given them a runway instead that they can be sure they can take off into something better than you lived in. Thank you very much. Gary. Um, even spoke uh, brilliant as usual about generational challenge. So let me narrow it to an individual challenge. Generation is, is yes, great. But how is being made by individual decisions of all of us? And I think the greatest uh, problem we're facing today, okay, my, my daughter is just turned 16, so in two years she also goes to college. And I know a little bit about this, this, this age. And, um, it's that we, we don't want to take a stand because you look at your roommates, teammates, classmates. Do I want to be different? Let's, you know, let's play by the rules. Let's not uh, 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 um, be called, uh, uh, it's not, not being a pariah, but there's some, some, somehow it's even just feeling uncomfortable that I'm not you know, with, within the group. So it's, it's about uh, individual decisions, taking a stand. And, uh, and also you just heard a phenomenal story of, of Ivan's personal story. You know what one person can do, even you know under such dire circumstances as Zimbabwe. So there's a lot of things one person can do, because somehow you do this first step, and others, maybe not immediately, but they'll follow. So uh, take a stand, and uh, I think that's what is important these days: is just you know to understand that you know nothing happens without us taking a risk. Risk. You know, if we want to, if we want to, to uh, eliminate the, the, this, this intricate connection between risk and rewards, so we'll end up printing money. But the government can do, we cannot. So that's why we have to understand that risk 
is, 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 is a necessary uh, price we pay for potential success. We may fail. So what? We can continue. But risk means courage. And I could just end up, you know, quoting uh, allegedly Winston Churchill, though it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's this, this, this in question. So the courage is the first of all human qualities because this is the one that guarantees all the others. Well, I will say courage can be contagious. And thank you both for demonstrating that in a very personal way today, as well as a way that is very uh, sort of powerful. I think you've also encouraged all of us to think about the agency we have as individuals, as an institution, as a community, and as a nation. Um, and thank you for giving us some hope, because you are both optimists, I think, about the future. So please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you, Jerry. Speakers, uh, sorry, Avon, we're yeah. going to be going out this way just to let you both leave first, and then we'll let everybody depart. Thank you again.